Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Judy Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Trying to figure out how to create strategy in this new world of uncertainty? Well, according to Tara Rathor, an expert on strategy, governance, and executive leadership, and author of Charting the Course, CEO Tools to Align Strategy and Operations, the pandemic has given us all the opportunity to become more precise and visionary as we build strategies into the future. Her formula is that we start with a destination, focus on value, and then build on what's working. First, get clear on where you're going because most likely success looks much different now. Second, determine where you've created the most value these days because defining your value helps get your employees better engaged and your customers more excited. Finally, by utilizing the Plus Delta tool in her book, Charting the Course, you can strengthen your company by building on what's working to generate revenue in the new business environment. As long as you follow these steps, your strategy will lead to greater success as you team anywhere. Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere. I'm your host, Ginny Bianco Mathis on the East Coast. And I am here with my wonderful co-host, Mitch Simon on the West Coast. And today we have a repeat distinguished guest, Tara Rethor who is an expert, a practitioner, and a seasoned consultant in the areas of strategy, leadership, and teams. And not only does she do heavy consulting and rights in this area, she holds groups of leaders where she helps them share what they are going through and help them think through the future of their organizations and themselves personally. And once again, the topic of returning to the office is back on the agenda. And much of the news and conversation focuses on when and how to return to work uh, as if we all have been on vacation for the last 18 months. Uh, CEOs are alternately applauded or vilified for their statements about what their organizations will do. So first of all, Tara, welcome. Thank you, Jenny. Hey, Mitch. Nice to see you or hear you guys today. It's really exciting to be back. I appreciate the invite. Oh, it is so good to be interacting with you again. So what are you hearing, Tara? This Well, I think, you know, what's interesting, Jenny, is that the most of the conversations about returning to the office reduce this whole thing to a binary question. Are we in the office or are we out of the office? And that seems to be the question. But then they add in hybrid, and that's sort of intended, I think, to bridge the two options. And they don't necessarily explain explicitly what that means, like how do they define it? And then all this conversation ensues. But I wonder kind of is when and how we return to the office really the right question? Because on its own, it's not helping to increase the clarity. It's not helping people to understand what that means. And it doesn't help anybody take a decision about whether they should do anything or how they should proceed. So I think CEOs need to start thinking more strategically about this. Oh, wow. What a key word there. That's a wonderful segue. I understand you have this uh, wonderful, fabulous new book. I'm looking at it right now. And it's all about making strategy work. And what I love about it is that it is filled with tools to assist strategic thinking and the kinds of decisions that CEOs uh, and their teams really have to grapple with these days. So whenever a leader or team needs a tool to think things through or reach decision, I noticed there's a tool to guide the process. (laughs) I kept testing it. Oh, my God, there was the tool. 
I have to say, Tara, uh, someone who works in this area, I think that was a masterful feat. You really took that process and codified it, uh, I think, in, in a way that's going to help a lot of people. Well, thank so you. So how do executives get to the right question and address this idea of getting and going back to work strategically? Well, you know, thank you, first of all, Jenny. I think that's awesome. And it really has been quite an adventure. One of the things, as I say in the book, is that much depends on where you are in your strategic journey. And you alluded to that as well. So yeah, there are 25 tools, they all have the aids, et cetera, but how do you then choose which one of those is going to make the best use of your time and effort and get you to those decisions? And so then for this particular challenge, you have to kind of step back and say, all right, there are three things I think you need to do that I would recommend. One is start with the destination, two, focus on value, and then build on what's working. I think those are the three things that are most likely wow. to take you forward. This is a very powerful thing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Take you forward. Very powerful technique. So let's let's uh, divide those up and look at them a little more closely. So let's start with the destination. What do we do with that? Well, before you can consider how or when, you got to start with why, right? What what end? To what end? It's a question I ask all the time with my clients and all the executives. It's like, to what end? What purpose? Why are we doing this? What's the rationale? That's your destination. So if you're starting with your destination, you have to be able to answer the question, to what end? To what end are we returning to the office? What is it that we're trying to achieve? So it's also your vision, right? It's it's the thing that you're trying to do. And in the last 18 months, your world has fundamentally shifted. It doesn't seem to matter what business you are in, where you're located, how you work in the past versus how you're working now. Your world has shifted. And so what, what are you trying to achieve? And then how has that impacted you? So I think at that point, I'd take a look at your external landscape, right? Let's go look at what the business contact is. Find a framework, and there is a framework, to really understand what the new business context is. We need to kind of let go of the old, right? That tool then helps you impact, assess the impact of what the changes in your landscape have done to your business or what they might mean for you going forward. What impact has that had on your vision, the destination, what you're trying to achieve, the why? So what's changed? Right, right. And, and obviously, or not so obviously to some teams, doing that extend, uh, extend, oh, sorry, external landscape questioning um, is paramount so they can step all the way back and uh, not deal with assumptions, but really look at some hard, concrete questions that are going to make them take their their own tunnel version uh, off. Um, and I know from being another tool lady that such tools facilitate the right conversation. So as you said, what really has changed? Um, so let's move on to the second I, I want to ask a question. Um, yeah, so Tara, um, <clears throat> we, as a, as a CEO, hold on one sec. <clears throat> As a CEO, I have my I have my world before COVID. We all came to the office, we all had our butts in our chairs, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, and I was very happy. And now COVID happened, and and it's hard for me to vision something different than what I experienced. So how can I how can I give in, you know, given now this new, you know, the new technologies that are out there, how can I create, or do you have any tools that are going to help me create a vision of what I want the new world to look like? Sure. I mean, there are tools obviously in the book that you can use. However, I think what's most important is to do exactly what you've just said, Mitch, and that's kind of step out of what your current thinking is. And one of the reasons why I start with a destination and B external landscape is that we're trying to figure out 
what other things are looking like, like get out of wherever our current office situation is, right? Get out of our current world and start expanding that thinking. And a vision board, for example, is a wonderful way of just thinking beyond the moment, thinking about beyond what this looks like. And I think sometimes that may mean that your vision needs to change completely. Sometimes you say, you know what, we still want to get there, but everything else around it may be different or getting there is defined differently. So success may still look a little differently. So you have to kind of ask that question again around what does success look like? So visioning, yes, you can go back and look at it, but the more important piece is that it's not just the words on the page that describe your vision. It's really understanding what it means. I had a CEO do that recently. He really had to step back and say, okay, yeah, we want growth, but gosh, that's not helpful. I need to understand and be more explicit about what do I mean by that? How do we know if we're there? And he really went back to the drawing board in many respects. And if you do a visioning board, you're literally on a drawing board. He really had to stop and think about it again and say, okay, hang on. What are we thinking about? And what does that look like? And started over. And he didn't change his vision in the end. He started talking about it in a different way so that it had more meaning for the folks in his organization. So it may not be that you've got the wrong destination. It may just be that you need to really place it into a different context so that people get what it means. Can, can you give us some examples of, um, of things that you and, and the CEO were creating that, are, that will give our audience more of an understanding of what to look for? Sure. Some questions around what's changed, what's different versus last year. Um, what do we like about what we're doing, right? In this world, it's not just about place as well. So things like what is the most, what are the relationships that we need to be effective in achieving our objective? People don't often think about the relationships. They think about um, how they do business. They think about who they're talking to in the hall or on the phone. It's really about how are you creating those relationships and then thinking through, do we have the relationships we need right now for where we're headed? Or do we need to be adjusting that? Are we able to nurture those relationships? What outcomes do we need? What What's the most important outcome we need that we know will help us drive towards success? If we can identify that, then again, you can start thinking through a little differently around the how and the where with respect to the big question we've talked about, do we, how do we return to the office? Does it really matter? So I th those are the questions that we started looking at in addition to the big one that I mentioned earlier, which was what does success look like? And we started big and started dri driving down. We need X number of new customers. We need more percent, a higher percentage of new versus returning customers. They were way too dependent on their current customer base and their customer base, their worlds have changed. So they needed to really rethink that piece as well. And they needed new partners. So they needed different relationships. And those are the steps that they're taking to move forward. And that has dictated how they handle their offices, their spaces, because they're also in different locations, right? So their situation, like so many people, is different depending on the specific facility you're talking about. It gets even more important if you've got a manufacturing or distribution type of business where people need to be together. So if you're doing a vision board, um, it's different from what might have been done previously. Um, I, I like to say, I even say uh, the vision statement is no longer valid. I like to say you need a vision scenario. Mm. It looks like this. It feels like this. Right. Yeah. I, it may have a number attached over here, and, but it's the how, the why. And maybe that's the gift the pandemic has given us. It's forced us to look at the how and the why. Well, yeah. And it kind of goes back. So the how and the why are key pieces of the, of the strategy, right? Because the strategy in, in my definition, and you and I, Jenny and, and, and Mitch have talked about this before, 
the way I think of strategy is fairly simple. It's the set of decisions and actions you need to get you where you want to go. So that clearly involves how and why. You got to know the to what end. And the vision piece of that is, of course, the destination, the to what end, the why. But it's also got to be compelling. It's got to be something that people can picture in their minds. It's one of the reasons why I like that vision board because it does bring in visuals, but it doesn't have to be all pictures or images. What you suggested and what you were saying, Jenny, is that it needs to be bigger than just a statement. It's not a set of words. It's got to have that meaning. And I think that's the drawback to a statement. And it doesn't matter what situation we're in, pandemic or not. I think the pandemic, I agree with you, has helped to really illustrate the limitations of a statement. Yeah. Well, then that beautifully takes us to the next overlay. So you got your vision board, you've done this environmental checklist scan, and you've seen what's changed. You have some more parameters around what you want this vision to be, but to a point you just made, to bring it alive, you need to add your second element, which I believe you said was value. Yeah. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. Whatever business you're in, whatever sector you serve, your business to business, your business to cons consumer, business to government, whatever work you do, you've got to deliver value. If you don't add value, you're out of business, period. It's common. It's also fundamental and foundational, right? So it doesn't depend, that challenge there doesn't depend on where people physically sit at all. Certainly, at least in my experience, and I've written a few articles about this, customer service, right? People's patience with the blame COVID rationale is wearing quite thin, right? So it doesn't mean COVID is yeah. no longer a yeah. challenge. It's just, okay, we've had 18, minute, 18 months at least to adapt and figure out how to manage that challenge. Let's get with it, people. Um, really important in your front office. And your front office looks different depending on what sector you're serving, right? So there are two questions. What value do you add for your customers, right? And how you deliver that value. And then how well have you delivered on that value, particularly over the last 18 months? If you're not delivering well in the last 18 months, you're going to have oh, a hard wow. time delivering well going forward. Don't blame COVID. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Right. Right. Um, I've heard you also speak that sometimes um, if you leave that value piece out, then folks actually start to get bored with the vision yeah that you you know all right well we've accomplished it right and right. and now what the value piece is almost the spark i think it can be the value sometimes people talk about purpose very often value add is tied to purpose for people and i think so the conversations that you hear about purpose if you dig a little deeper, you can start thinking about if this is our purpose, right? If this is the, the important thing that we're doing, this is the thing that we're adding to the universe, right? Depending on your purpose, that adds value. It makes it better to be human. It makes it better to be in a community. These are the things that, that staff in particular feel very passionate about and often can bridge the gap with respect to whether or not they want to stay with an organization or take those decisions. It's the same for your customers. Right. I think the pandemic has really highlighted that because it's not just the pandemic, but it's also all of the social and um, personal equity questions that we have been wrestling with as a society, as communities, as, as individuals over gosh, millennia, that really also came to a head in the last 18 months that start bringing that in. That's part of the change in your business context. And so if you can't figure out the answer to what value do we add, 
and how well do we add it and deliver on it, you probably can't inspire anybody, even if your business is very foundational utility structure, right? You, you don't need to be doing some um, right. really awesome charitable work to add value to the world or to your customers. Right, right. Now, and I, this seems to be a great place for you to talk about a tool you like to use, the plus delta evaluation approach. I was intrigued with that. Yeah, the plus delta approach is one that I like for really understanding what works and what can be improved. That's the idea. The delta in math is used to indicate change. So if you do a plus, meaning additive or keep it, and a delta, meaning improve or change it, it makes a very compelling conversation around what works, what can be improved, what might we want to change. I think that's a really important tool in this case, not always specifically for value, but for understanding the impact of the last 18 months on your value proposition. So if you're not clear on your value proposition, go back and figure out what the heck that is first, right? If you are clear on your value proposition and you're trying to figure out how well you delivered on the value, start thinking about what worked, what could be improved, what might we change? And I think you start coming to a, it's a very positive and forward thinking kind of approach because we've learned a lot in the last 18 months, really a lot. And it gives you the chance to think about that, right? And figure out which of the things that happened in the last 18 months that we used and adapted to make things better or just to survive the pandemic, right? Which is a valid outcome, right? Just weathering this storm. Which of those things really worked well? Because that's a new source of value for you. And it may be purely internal value for your staff, but there's plenty of research out there. You've probably done some yourself, Jenny, that talks about the fact that happy customer or staff, happy staff, contented staff, staff that believe in what you're trying to do, make for very, very good customer ambassadors, no matter what business you're in. This, I did that or that exercise with a different CEO in a different organization because they adapted to the pandemic in a way that the CEO did not expect to. They're a technology company. So really where they sit in terms of their business is less important. They're not a meatpacking plant. They are not healthcare. You know, they don't have to be on the ground floor with their customers, right? And they don't even have to be always together with each other for everything. However, this CEO loves the in-person, really struggled even with the fact that he had multiple offices and he'd make the rounds, did a lot of trying to encourage FaceTime, really participate. And that's where his head was. And he started looking at what's working. He had changed a good number of his behaviors. And we actually had a conversation around, okay, let's talk about your leadership and what's changed in your leadership. So it wasn't even just a meta conversation for the company. It was in, in the work that you've done and how you, CEO, deliver value. What are you doing differently to make that work? And how well is it being received? And we did a, had a conversation around a plus delta that said, these are the things that are working well. These are the things I could improve. And at the end of the day, his company will be virtual forever. Forever. They've just, and that fundamental 180 degree shift for this particular CEO personally, just completely different approach for him. Right. 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 Yeah, you also shared with me in the past, uh, I think, a lovely example with a museum. Oh, yeah. Those guys, they did a fabulous job. And talk about thinking on your feet and being nimble. So they're a museum. They have indoor and outdoor exhibits. Um, but their exhibits, curation, their the opportunity to be there, the exploration – all of that's their value proposition. It's not necessarily different than other museum types of venues, 
But everything they did relied on in-person work, in-person interaction. And they, they had to like, they, they were shut down like so many others. And yet it was the peak season for them because they're, they have a lot of things that happen beginning in April every year and go all the way through to about October. That's like this most vibrant time for this particular museum and their outdoor gardens and their venues and all their programs. So they were like, oh, oh my goodness, we're out of business if we don't do something. And they immediately created virtual tours faster than anybody I'd seen, really created them. Lots of other people did that. They did it fast. And it also is not the same. And initially it wasn't helping their bottom line. It was free, right? They were just maintaining face, literally awareness, position. They had members who had already paid membership. So they were providing things to help kind of in the moment, help them do that. The CEO though, took them through a systemic process to really understand, you know, okay, good. We're all up and running. We're virtual. We're keeping people happy to some extent. We're getting the word out. We're doing the things to sort of maintain the base we've got. She said, what do we do to get new people? What do we do if this thing goes on for a long time and there are renewals? We need to have new. We need to have other. We need to have more. So she took them through a very, very systemic process, including a plus delta and other aspects to really rethink value. What's their value proposition? What does it really mean? And how might they shape that and frame it, like talk to their customers, like share with their members, here's the value that we add in a very different way. You know, this is what's so exciting about it. This is what you yeah, learn yeah. from going through this this way. And that let them preserve their revenue model. And that was really important to them because they're highly dependent on members, gate revenue, people coming in and the sponsorships. So you do things differently and you, and you try to come up with how to use some new tools uh, in this virtual or hybrid, and you still, the, a major part of the equation is still the bottom line. Well, well if you can't, <laughs> and, you know, I... And, uh, it sounds like this, you know, yeah. The CEO really got it, right? right? Because well, at the end of the day... Always, yeah. Basically, the CEO has uh, been... It's, so it's, I know. Um, you have, through your examples, uh, you have given, um, you've already answered your last element, which was to um, build on what's working. And, and you gave some great examples. So I'd like to go to a, an overlying component um, in the end here. You mentioned culture a little bit uh, here and there, and I, I wanted to build on that. Um, what do you have to share about that? And I would expect there's a tool for that also. Oh, of course. There's a tool for everything. That's the beauty of it, as you said earlier. Um, yeah, culture. There's been lots of talk about culture as the reason for returning to the office. You hear that, for example, from Goldman Sachs or Amazon. We are an in-office culture. First of all, it's unclear what that really means right? But secondly, it's not helpful, right? Generally speaking, when you're in crisis, pandemic or not, when you're in crisis, the elements of your culture that are really helpful become really obvious, as do the elements of your culture that are really not helpful, right? So it's really important to understand what that looks like. And the key thing is that, you know, culture cannot be dictated. It is, however, something that CEOs, executives shape simply by the way they behave and the decisions that they take, right? The most important thing to remember, though, about culture, in, in my opinion, is that the culture you have 
may not be the culture you need. So Goldman, Amazon, anybody else who says we are an in-office culture, that's not helpful in an out-of-office world. So that's not necessarily the culture they need. Whether or not it's good, not relevant. It's just not relevant. That's, I think that's a key piece of what we have been talking about. And, and even in, in, in thinking about elements of culture, it's like, do a culture audit and then figure out if how that works with respect to what you're trying to achieve. Are the elements that you have the ones that make the most sense that are getting in the way of your vision or your ability to execute on it or the things that are making it possible for you to do great things? The CEO of that museum, they were an in-building, in-facility, in-museum culture. Not helpful. Really not helpful for them. They took that look and said, okay, we need to figure out how to deliver museum and curation without being in the building. Right, right. Excellent. Um, I love that new view uh, towards looking at it. Uh, And I know I personally am going to spend some, some more time with that culture audit questions. I think it takes a leader down a path that he or she and the team may not want to go down because, oh, my God, you know, it can't touch this culture. Yeah, you know, um, and it, it, it may need to change, too. So I, I, I love that. Well, the thing, the other thing, too, to, to remember, if you if you remember in the roadmap on culture, one of the elements of that, one of the pieces of that puzzle is origins. So you don't you need to incorporate like where you came from. How were you, how did you arrive here as well yes. into your culture? And I think that's you know important. I, I kind of held up Goldman and Amazon as possibly being um, behind the times on that. That may or may not be true. There are elements of how they got there that they may need to keep and preserve and want to preserve going forward. So it's not a throw the baby with the bathwater. You know, it is really about reflecting yes. on what you've got. Right. 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 And, and what's going to be helpful to take you forward. Oh, absolutely. Well, I love this. I love how you broke this up into those three major elements with this overlay of culture. And I, I feel as a practitioner, as a person out there that is trying to uh, assist leaders and uh, as a leader uh, myself, I It makes me feel good to know I have an infrastructure of tools and the power of those questions and those templates to make sure the right discussions happen. Um, So even, you know, so the leader doesn't take a whole team off track. It almost equalizes everyone in the room. I think at least that's beautiful. Well, tell us, Tara, how can people get in touch with you and get that book? Well, you can definitely go to Amazon and you can look for charting the course, CEO tools to align strategy and operations. You can look under my name, Tara Rathor. And if you just want more information about it, toolsforceos.com will take you to the book page on our website. In addition, you can always email me. It's trathor at strategyforreal.com. And in the website address, the four is the number four. And in the tools for CEOs, Dot com address, the four is, again, the number four. So um, you can definitely reach out. I'd love to hear what's happening on your particular situation. We can schedule a few minutes to chat about it and happy to, to talk about it. Beautiful. Mitch? Yeah, I'm looking up toolsforceos.com, which is just a great place to go to get all of these tools. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at the book right now, and there's um, really good stuff on, you know, we were asking questions about what, what do we need to keep? What do we need to change? And some really good questions to really help us with that. And I do, I'm, I'm closing here because I really do appreciate the nature of getting the destination right and being open and curious to, to look at things that have worked, which just didn't, they're, they're not representative of your quote unquote culture before COVID. And I do think that as we're, we're trying to define the new destination, we really have to be open 
to um, what's changed. And I, and I do think that for us who do plan strategy, we have to appreciate um, this change, even though we don't like it, you know? Well, and one last point, the questions and the templates force the folks that are having this discussion, it forces them to go beyond, well, here's what we did before COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I found that's the first place they like to go. Yeah. So these are powerful. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tara. And thank you, Ginny. And thank you to our wonderful audience, our listeners. Um, if you've enjoyed this episode, which we have, please um, share this with your friends and colleagues and uh, definitely give us a, a nice five-star review um, and um, put your comments in so that we know how to make the show even better. Until next time, thank you for uh, joining us for another episode of Team Anywhere. Team Anywhere.